Welcome to the opening seminar in the 2014 Engage seminar series dedicated to influencing both the debate and the decisions about movement and connectivity in Liverpool city centre. And welcome to this fabulous venue, the Museum of Liverpool, courtesy of David Fleming, Director of National Museums Liverpool which was opened at a cost of £74 million on the 19th of July 2011 and which won the Council of Europe Museum Prize in 2013. It is the world's first national museum dedicated to the history of a regional city. The reason we're in this place is to celebrate and pay homage to the city and culture that we are learning from tonight, Copenhagen. This magnificent museum was designed by Danish architect Kim Nielsen and 3XN, the company he founded in 1986 in Copenhagen. Into this little bit of Copenhagen and Liverpool, we were to welcome our two guest speakers, Oliver Schultz, and Klaus Bondum. However, Klaus turned up this morning at Copenhagen Airport without his passport, and so hasn't been able to join us. Oliver, on the other hand, went to the airport prepared, and so we are massively relieved and delighted to welcome him here tonight. He knows the city and region well, having studied in Manchester and his friends here in the University of Liverpool School of Architecture. In June last year, he gave the keynote address at the Baltic Area Showcase. He was for many years director of Gale Studios at Gale Architects, whose founder, Jan Gale, was the inspiration behind Engage's Cities for People seminar series in 2012. He runs now the Schultz Grassoff Partnership Oliver has said, and this is a quote from him, I believe that streets are the key bearers of shared urban culture in human settlement. So for a great urban everyday life in the future, we need to start building better streets. Our panelists this evening represent three strategic areas of life. Councillor Malcolm Kennedy in the centre is the Cabinet Member for Regeneration. And David Hughes on uh, his left is Interim Head of Planning in Liverpool City Council and is representing Mark Kitts, the Assistant Director of Regeneration, who has sent his apologies. Both Councillor Kennedy and David Hughes are significant people in the delivery of a better city centre. Jack Skillen on the far right has come from London to be here tonight and didn't need a passport and so has arrived and is head of projects at Living Streets, which he'll tell us something about later. We've invited someone from a national grassroots organization to be part of our panel at each of the seminars this year. And all of you, speaker and panelists, are most welcome. For those of us who live here in the city centre and waterfront, we know only too well that though the city is indeed a great place to live and has improved dramatically from where it was only a few decades ago, it is not a pedestrian-friendly city, nor is it bike-friendly, and the public transport around the city centre leaves a lot to be desired. The car still reigns supreme and virtually unchallenged, despite there being a great deal of evidence to show that cities all over the world are moving away from a mobility culture dominated by the private motor car. During these three seminars, we intend to explore the mobility culture that rules in our city and ask what we would like it to be. We're starting tonight by looking at an international comparator city, and that will be followed by three national comparators next time, 
Bristol, Nottingham and London. And then finally, we'll return to Liverpool and see what plans the mayor has for this city. We hope that this series will have a positive impact on our elected members and council officers as they attempt to take forward everyone's commitment to improving transport and mobility in the city centre. The city centre strategic investment framework document produced in 2012 and accepted by the mayor as the plan for investment for the next 15 years makes clear that we have aspirations for Liverpool to be considered a world-class city on a par with any comparable city. The mayor has asked Mott MacDonald, a global management, engineering and development consultancy with an office in the Liver Building, to draw up a report for him about the consequences for movement and connectivity from the SIF recommendations. And that report is almost ready to go public. Perhaps ele elements of it might be released even before the end of this series. Through these annual seminars, Engage has been creating a forum where residents and stakeholders together can express their views and make clear their aspirations for the city. This process is vital if we are to move forward together. The people of Scotland have just shown us how civic engagement is done and how energizing it is when everyone is given a real say in making the decisions that will change and transform their lives and those of the generations following them. Before I invite our first speaker, I want to thank our sponsors who have made this series possible. Curtains, and I know we have members of Curtains here tonight. PIE, Planet Intelligent Environments, and I see people from Planet here as well. The Chartered Institution of Highways and Transportation and Liverpool City Council. The process we're going to follow tonight is I'm going to invite our keynote speaker to address us first, and then that will be followed by a maximum five minutes response from each of the three panelists, and then we'll throw open the debate to the floor so that we can give as much time as we can to your questions and comments. So without any further delay, I invite Oliver Schultz to come forward. Um, the international perspective is, of course, uh, is the first one that you've chosen to, to, uh, to run, Jerry. Um, and I'd like to share with you, uh, you know, perspectives from another city that, that often is actually called one of the world's most livable cities and a world-class city and something that we brand and market quite heavily. Um, and I'd like to give you some impressions and maybe show you some of the kind of both the policies and the kind of design professions kind of responses to, to what that means and how we've created that city. Um, because, you know, having a kind of a, a vision and a policy is, is one thing, but I think it's really, really good to understand how the physical environment actually delivers that. Um, yeah, so... Um, so let me actually, this was actually where we wanted to make the transition, yeah? So, so I'm an architect and an urban designer, and uh, I work in, in practice, I, I teach, I've taught at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles, Washington University in St. Louis, and at the, the U University of Liverpool. Um, so I work a lot with uh, both with kind of public space research and trying to understand how the streets and the spaces of our city work. And in the practice context, um, I try to actually translate that into, yeah, into build reality. Okay. Um, so Copenhagen, as I said, is, you know, one of the cities that is kind of renowned for having a very good quality of life. Uh, what we in our office at Schulze Plus Grasser work with is really all the bits and bobs that actually try and build this fantastic city. Um, and to be honest, we export that. So we export what Copenhagen also has achieved over several generations is actually the thing that we try and sell in other cities as a practice. Um, Copenhagen is not really that far away. It's, a, it's an hour's flight, sometimes a little bit more, sometimes a little bit less, depending on the kind of 
wind speed. Um, but really, it's, you could say it's not really that much different. We are also close to the water. Uh, we're a capital city, but your city sometimes has buildings and spaces, the, the scale of which you would expect in a capital city, of a smaller country maybe. Um, but otherwise, kind of our geographic kind of latitude, climate, all of those things I think are very, very comparable. So there's very little of what you'll see now in my presentation that you couldn't imagine in, in Liverpool. At least there's no, no climatic reasons why these things shouldn't be possible. So Monocle, I don't know if you want to call them kind of guardians of describing what is the best city on the planet, but we, we have topped several times the Monocle list of what creates the most livable city in the world. Uh, there's other indices, there's many indices that kind of rank cities according to quality of life, crime, business-friendly climate, and so on. And Copenhagen, as all the other Scandinavian capitals, tends to do very well. Um, I think it's also a note of caution. The other cities that do very well are you know, places like Panama do well, um, Geneva. Um, often, actually, it's cities that aren't really that exciting. Often, it's actually quite boring places that do very well in these, these kind of surveys. But um, Copenhagen uh, yeah, has kind of boring sides to it and very exciting sides to it. Um, Copenhagen to yeah, people who've lived there a while, I've been there for 10 years, is a city of old public spaces. So Copenhagen over uh, really, well, it was A, it was spared by the Luftwaffe in the Second World War, so there is really no substantial bomb damage. Um, really, it's a city that really hadn't, didn't have the challenge of rebuilding itself after the Second World War. Uh, so really, we have lots of really old buildings and really new buildings side by side uh, without uh, conflict. Uh, and we've updated our public spaces over yeah, the last decades to, yeah, to the same kind of level of quality, especially in the city center. Um, we are also yeah, uh, a city that has some new experiments with public spaces that tries to work with tighter public sector budgets to see how you can work with, without granite and natural stone sometimes to still create places and iconic public spaces um, yeah, that could, can become the heart of their community, a community that's transforming at the moment very much. One thing uh, Jerry was keen on talking about today is you know, Copenhagen is one of the world's leading cities in providing bicycle infrastructure and a framework for how uh, cycling culture can emerge and be strengthened. And I'll focus quite a bit on that, and Klaus's presentation is very much on that. Um, and it is, we have. We have both a bicycle culture and the bicycle infrastructure that actually makes, makes cycling part of everyday life. And it's, it's something that, yeah, we market in some way, but it's just kind of part of our daily life. To most of us, it's really nothing, nothing special. Um, okay, that's uh, missing the the headlines, but, um, but basically I think one thing that is important about kind of understanding Copenhagen is understanding the Scandinavian tradition and the history of the last century. Uh, Scandinavia really is very much about people. Uh, the kind of paragraph one of our school law says that um, children are, are to be socialized uh, to in school. The school's curriculum is to be designed so that students understand from year one that they are part of a bigger society and understand themselves as a part of that system. Um, and that really is reflected in many aspects of govern governance and planning that really people are really the center of, of, yeah, of our thinking, of policy making and so on. Um, and really it's reflected in, in, in every aspect of life. Copenhagen is often kind of also a place where, you know, we find books, uh, cities for people, and life between buildings. Uh, I guess the kind of books that have emerged in the, you know, by Jan Gehl and other writers that talk a lot about, yeah, the soft qualities of city. Uh, what, what they are, would argue and do argue is that uh, the city is not just made of stones, but it is the kind of life and the flesh between the stones that really creates uh, 
the environment and our yeah our human settlement and that is very much about understanding you know how to create a a day uh, and a week and a year where people have access to a stimulating urban environment uh, so a place where you feel part of a bigger whole a place where you have access to people and life when you want that um, and a kind of a yeah a kind of a place where you can live so you can withdraw into your private house or, or apartment when you want that but the key here being Copenhagen has been very very good at creating a place where we can choose either or so yeah we can live in kind of uh, yeah, well-designed apartments and homes, uh, but we have city on tap. We can decide when we when we want city and when not. Um, and the the headline here reads complex but not complicated. In our firm, we work for us. That means really the city. Uh, you know, it, if if we say things like it starts with people, and we need to think about how we experience the city. Uh, that's really rather simple. That's not complicated. Because, but of course, the built environment as the the total of buildings, open spaces, transportation space, uh, you know, is a rather complex thing. Um, and I think we've learned over the last century that working in silos to kind of one department dealing with streets, another with what's happening in buildings, another with the public spaces, that's not necessarily a recipe for for success. Um, so, so I think today, um, and we've talked a lot about one of the missing pieces in the puzzle of creating a better Liverpool is maybe working with streets and taking our thinking, our conceptions of what streets are and what they need to be able to do and what they should do in the future to a new level. And I think there's a good reason for that. You know, I think public spaces in general, squares are great, they are good for kind of giving addresses and places to hang out when the weather is nice. Uh, yeah, parks we all know are great as well. But, um, you, know, uh, you know, busy people today, you know, I don't know when you've been the last time and sat in a square or been in a park in your city, but, you know, everybody's come here today via a street. I think if we we want to improve the quality of life in our cities, you know, disproportionately much will really rest on our ability to create better streets. Uh, good squares and good parks are a bonus, I would argue. So, so maybe a kind of a, a 101 in kind of urban design very quickly. Uh, Copenhagen has been very good at some very, very simple things. Um, so I think it just so happens that our city that we move around today, um, you know, is, as I said, it wasn't really rebuilt after the Second World War. Uh, it still has a kind of a building structure and a, yeah, a kind of a, a kind of environment where we have a lot of stimulation. We, we have a lot of streets where, you know, we would have kind of lots of units in the ground floors with sometimes chain stores, sometimes independent businesses, but in general, if you move around the city of Copenhagen, either walking or on a bike, you will kind of pass through streets that both have a very interesting building envelope and have a street detail, a kind of a material language that senses frequent positive stimulation. And that's really important because I think our, our individual reaction to liking or disliking a place uh, is heavily dependent on our eyesight. You know, it's really by the way that we are designed as people, uh, that we are forward-moving animals. Our kind of gaze is naturally forward or slightly down onto the street. Um, and really, 75% of the visual impressions that we process, uh, or 75% of the impressions that make up our image of quality are visual. So, so that simply means that the ground floor environment that we design is incredibly important. Um, and it really has to stimulate our brain in the right way. So, so for me, that means in the project that we work on uh, and what I call urban design is, is not the sprinkling of lamp posts and trees and benches um, to kind of tart up a street or an urban environment. For me, that has to do something with the consideration of the total ground floor plane. 
So that has disproportionately important in our cities is what happens on the ground floors of our buildings, how are the programs that we actually, through our zoning laws, um, facilitate, how do they communicate with sidewalks and street spaces, um, and how, do, how does all of that interact with transportation space? You know, how can a street be much more than a, a kind of a drainage channel for people moving them from A to B, but how can it actually be a kind of a corridor for life where much more happens? So that, the consequence of what I'm saying here, I think, is that we can't simply just have architects looking at that, landscape architects looking at that, highway engineers looking at that. We need to get much better at facilitating a dialogue both across professions and across city agencies that allows us actually to work hand in hand towards some goals. Um, <laughs> the headlines are all chopped off, uh, so this is a good test for me. Um, basically, I think there is three overriding principles that we could make out uh, or single out as being really important, especially as we're talking about mobility and streets. and. And one for me is, yeah, this kind of innocent looking diagram of prioritizing vulnerable communities. So I do think that Copenhagen has been incredibly good at making sure that the top priority uh, in our streets in the center of the city is given to walking, to cycling, to public transit, and to cars, and in that order. So yes, you can drive through Copenhagen, but but we make sure that everything else is prioritized higher. So, so it's kind of an innocent looking diagram, but it really sets up for a battle of renegotiating what happens in the public right of way, for renegotiating the space between the buildings. Um, and that really is where Copenhagen has been incredibly successful, and that is where you, know, you, can kind of, you can have a policy to do these things, but if you really want to implement stuff like this, you, yeah, you need to take some tough battles about how you organize carriageways, sidewalks, and so on. Um, this diagram is really about saying that there's no such thing as a pedestrian or a cyclist or a motorist. Uh, we are all most of those things every single day. Um, and it really is about how you facilitate a modal, a modal switch. How do you create an environment where it's actually easy to kind of to park your bike and to become a pedestrian, or to take your bike and get it onto a bus? Uh, how do you actually allow people to migrate between these states in a, in a comfortable and inviting way? Um, especially in a city of your size, you need to be able to think about these things, because it's highly unlikely that you'll be able to walk or cycle to all the destinations in your daily life. Um, and then it this one is really about proximity and getting all of these things in close uh, geographical location to one another. So the solution, I don't think, is to have gigantic pedestrian precincts and then to have some car roads over here. I think we have to make streets m work much harder to actually facilitate all of those modes of transport in a better way. Um, and I think that is actually the best way to facilitate creating a lively city, because if we the more things that happen uh, in, yeah, in a kind of a good relationship close to each other, the livelier the place will be. Um, just very quickly, before we run to Copenhagen, I just want to show you three slides of a street in Brighton that I worked on with uh, companies from the Northwest, actually, an engineer called Martin Stockley from Manchester and a company called Landscape Projects from Manchester, who are landscape architects was the transformation of a street in Brighton. Uh, Brighton uh, New Road is the name of the street. It's a street that really is, it, looks, it looked 10 years ago like a, a service street, but it actually happened to line some of the most historic uh, valued buildings like the Royal Pavilion in Brighton and the Royal Pavilion Gardens. Um, and really that, that was all about how could you effectively change an approach to how we look at streets as things that just facilitate moving from A to B, putting up signs and street markings of where people are supposed to be, and then realizing, well, actually, reality is different. People use the space different anyway. Um, and this I want to show you because I think also in the UK it's possible to design completely different environments where we designed this was a, 
the concept was for a, a pedestrian priority street with vehicle access permitted at all, all times was sometimes interpreted as a shared street, but in my view, this is very much a pedestrian priority street. This was pro re really prioritizing pedestrians, making sure that the pedestrian is king, not the car. But it didn't mean that cars didn't have access. In fact, nothing restricts car access. There's no signs telling you you can't drive in here. Uh, but just by way of design, uh, the car uh, movement has either displaced and gone to other streets, or it has um, reduced. Uh, greatly by over 90%. Cycling has gone up and car speeds generally have fallen. And you see a great range of things happening on, you know, what is a, a thousand square feet. You have people walking dogs, people si sitting on benches, people cycling one way, a taxi going another, people sitting in outdoor cafes and spending some money. Uh, so really, this is, this is not the result of kind of highway engineering. This is a result of thinking about both the landscape, the building functions on the ground floor, um, and a transportation culture in a new way, and bringing all of those things very, very close together. And so it is that really the impact of this has not just been aesthetic or design. Uh, there is now more people that, on the spur of the moment, actually buy a theater ticket. So we have evidence from theaters that have higher turnover. Uh, all the buildings within no time had scaffolding up and people actually, the private sector invested more money than the city had invested in actually delivering this project. So it stimulated a, a kind of a wider regeneration that you could argue is actually more, more important than the project itself. Um, just want to give a sign, yeah. So... So this was just a little bit of background of uh, yeah some of the goals that um, that we pursue in our work uh, and also trying to contextualize that transportation mobility are related to other important factors uh, in cities today. Um, I think we're just trying to change. Yeah. Okay. So. Here's a few slides that I've selected from Klaus's presentation because I think I don't just want our contribution tonight to be about design uh, and about, yeah, kind of livability, uh, but this is very much about understanding Copenhagen and other things that are related to those aspects. So as you can see in these historic photographs, for example, Copenhagen has always had cycling. Um, cycle infrastructure has been built since before the Second World War. If you cycle in Copenhagen today, it's very natural to, you know, to grow up sitting on the back of your parents' bike. If you get heavier and you get too, too big for sitting on the back of your parents' bike, 25% of households with more than one kid actually have one of these carrier bikes. And actually cycling is an important part of growing up in Scandinavia. That kid um, navigating streets alone, I think that's an important part of building confidence and kind of growing up and engaging with your city. Uh, the, the commissioner, uh, the Danish commis commissioner for climate action, Connie Hedegaard, she, you know, she was very much promoting this kind of Danish kind of way of life as a way forward for all of Europe in a way. Um, and yeah, I think Copenhagen makes it very easy for us to both uh, attach bicycle culture to a wider transportation culture and we have one in three home-to-work journeys now on a bike today already uh, in Copenhagen. So commuter traffic both in summer and here in winter, you can see, uh, is something that, uh, yeah, is, a, is it just a common image of our cities? Um, and, and interestingly enough, the prioritization, the first snow removal vehicles that are going out will be something that's a meter and 80 wide. And the first thing that is cleaned in our streets is, the, is actually the cycle path. That's the lifeline that will keep our city moving. And then after that, the snow plows clean the rest of the, the carriageway. Um, so, you know, whether cycling is kind of for social functions, but it's also something that keeps the elderly and the, the youngest, as, I sh as I've shown, moving uh, in the city. Um, so I want to just maybe have a quick touch on why people cycle. Copenhagen isn't full of people that are trying to live a sustainable lifestyle or 
uh, for whom this is kind of a, a kind of a fashion statement, uh, really just as pragmatic as the, as the English, uh, the Danes think it's faster. It's the fastest way to get around our city. It's the most convenient. Uh, it's really, it's got more to do with that than it has with kind of climate concerns or anything like that. So really more than half the population thinks that that's the, the fastest way to get around. Um, and the, we have the infrastructure to make it the fastest way. Um, research is proving that there are more and more kind of uh, side effects, you could say, of having built good bicycle infrastructure actually is reducing the hospital bills in our country. Sorry, this is on some kind of 10-second cycle, so, but that's good. That'll keep me talking quicker. Um, but basically, in, in Denmark, now cities are partially responsible for the p bills of the hospital. So all of a sudden, people are realizing that cardiac-related uh, health problems are, are actually related to the way that people move around cities, and our cities can save money, and our national economy can save money by getting people on bikes. Uh, students have better results if they, if they cycle and if they are physically active. So, and people simply get older. People get older if they walk and cycle more. So, you know, calculations have been carried out that, you know, for every kilometer that you cycle in your country, there is a wider national economic benefit of seven kroner. That'll be 80 pence, I believe. So just under a pound is the kind of national benefit, the windfall generated for our national economy uh, from yeah, longer lifetimes, improved health conditions, um, and so on. So, so there is an emerging sense that this has an economic dimension, not just a kind of a, a lifestyle dimension, if, if you want to say. And here I just want to show you, this is a kind of a timeline from 1912, and you saw the historic images. Uh, our bicycle infrastructure wasn't kind of built over two, three legislation periods. It was something that you know, was a long haul. This is kilometers. So we now have in the region of 400 kilometers, uh, but that was actually built since the 1930s. So, you know, that's, I guess, soon to be 90 years in the making. But uh, very consistently, you know, we've kind of extended the system. And... I think so extensively that when, when somebody digs up the road in front of our homes and the crews arrive widening bicycle paths is not something where we would think long about. It gets a bit more sensitive when it runs past shops, but when it runs past homes, you wouldn't think twice about it, about complaining or not being happy. It's, it's just something that we do. Um, and that's kind of what that system looks like. So in our yeah, priority plan, Klaus calls it, uh, important is to understand that it's part of a network. It's not just a kind of embryonic system with a few kind of disconnected fragments. It's actually something that is connecting all the major roads will have bicycle infrastructure that will be clawed back either from the carriageway or from the sidewalk, um, so often from both. Um, um, and you can see here that we have, on top of that, we have something we call super, super highways, cycle super highways that make it more comfortable for commuters to travel longer distances on a bike. Um, so that's another 300 kilometers that we've planned that's part of re achieving Copenhagen's carbon emission targets. Um, and it really takes an amazing kind of form. I, Unfortunately, don't have pictures to show you this here, but if you, on an intersection on a cycle superhighway, come to a traffic light, either the traffic light will be synchronized, so you will have a green wave if you travel at bike speed, or if you do have to stop, you'll have a handle and a footrest to rest on. So there's a great set of kind of design responses that try to actually deliver this cycle superhighway, which is actually getting people to communicate, uh, sorry, to commute not just four kilometers, but get them to commute 10, 15, sometimes 20 kilometers. So some of the municipal policies that is this connected to here on the, on the slide, um, we have a eco-metropolis yeah, kind of translation of, of, of a policy for a, uh, yeah, a kind of a city that's more in tune with, uh, with its habitat. Um, and we have a metropolis for people. That's another policy, and that's more aimed at kind of the quality of life issues in the city. But both of these documents kind of 
have spurned uh, actions, priority actions that allow us to really invest our money in a kind of a defined target. So we want to become carbon neutral by the year 2025, and I think we want to reduce it with it by 20% over one legislative cycle. Um, and yeah, there's a great range of initiatives to kind of arrive at that. Um, uh, you know, we've talked plenty now about cycling, and of course, of course, what better way to kind of hit your emission targets than to get people out of cars and onto onto bikes? And that's not rocket science, um, but we also want to make it a much more yeah a place where less people get get injured. We do have uh, you know quite a few fa fatalities from cycling as well, um, but much less than if we were driving in cars, all of us. Um, the green and blue capital city, so there is an idea that uh, that you should also be able to get to to parks and to uh, yeah kind of swimming pools and so on uh, you know within a kind of a fifteen minute period so we 're kind of transforming our harbor for example uh, by building harbor baths and so on so our our water has been declared fit for swimming now, which i 'm sure that the Mersey water is as well. Um, so, so we're actually recycling that water and we're putting it in swimming pools that people can, can swim in. And our, our harbor has become a great leisure resource. So really kind of also start summarizing a little bit so we can uh, discuss a little bit more. So, so really the, I guess the idea is that we want to give people access to a more inviting and positive urban life. We want to get people to, to walk more. We're taking steps to get another 20% uh, more people walking than walk today. We already have quite a lot. Um, and actually, we want to get people to spend more, more time in the city. Uh, we want to actually get people out of their homes um, and into the public spaces more than we even do today. We think that's an important part of city life and what separates one city from another. That's not so much the square meters you build in apartments and homes, it's all the square meters that are between the apartments and homes that really create our shared identity and the uniqueness and character of our city. So here just one photograph, that's our crown prince, uh, so maybe we'll have a discussion about leadership and governance as well, but uh, we, our crown prince uh, I don't know, we, maybe we can see Prince Charles one day um, cycling on a carrier bike. So this is actually, this is not a marketing stunt. Klaus claims that this picture was taken by a paparazzi, uh, taking a picture of the crown prince delivering his, uh, his son uh, to, to kindergarten one morning. Uh, but looks dangerously manicured, this picture, with a kind of a dog. Could also, could also be an advert for dog food, I guess. Um, Klaus's boss at the time when Klaus was the uh, vice mayor for, for technology uh, and the environment was Rit Biergor. She was the, the mayor um, and, and all of these people kind of, yeah, a lot of them cycle to work. Our prime minister also at times cycles to work. So, so it's something that is practiced. So it's leadership from the front, you could say. Um, but it's something we extensively market, so you probably, it's impossible today to be involved in urban regeneration and not to be, you must be getting sick of stories about Copenhagen, I'm sure. Uh, uh, but, it, but it is something that we market quite heavily, so both Copenhagen and Amsterdam are really battling it out to be cycle city number one. Uh, but it is really a key part of our brand uh, by now, and uh, yeah, and it's it's... It's a positive brand and just so happens to tick so many boxes that politicians uh, need to tick. Um, and this is not my slide, I want to say. This is Klaus's slide. But uh, cycling is fast, cheap, fun, environmentally friendly, and makes my ass look great. Um, so, so where from here? And let's have a discussion about that. But our plan for 2025 is to be carbon neutral. Uh, that that is followed by strong commitments uh, in the yeah in the city government uh, uh, there's financial support to actually roll out the projects that will deliver these goals um, we have a strong collaboration broad st stakeholder involvement and new partnership models 
uh, the way that private and public sector can uh, yeah, work together to deliver these goals, because of course it's, it's delivered together. This is not done by the city as such. Um, yeah, and kind of yeah, communication and how you coordinate these efforts um, and really become, let the citizens become a part of this. So, so I'll, I'll kind of draw this to a close now. And uh, when I heard Klaus present this last time, I think I took away that what he was all about was saying that our every every person's role as a citizen in our in our city societies, uh, you know, from education, from the way that we are socialized, from the way that we take part in these processes. Is, is a big part of the Danish success stories. Um, so, so really, the kind of the way that we build our society and empower individual citizens to both live that kind of life and to become part of those decision-making processes uh, is really what, what he credits as being really the key to success in, in Copenhagen. Um, yeah. So I'll, I'll stop there, Jerry.